now it's my turn to bow out and hand off to the stars of this evening. I'm really, really excited for this event. Uh, I, I don't remember how it came to us, and I know there was a slight delay because of a publication delay, but I'm so glad that it has happened now and that we're here this evening to uh, celebrate the uh, new book by Tracy Cross, um, Root Work, and then she's going to be in conversation with her sister, Ter Terry Ellen Cross Davis, who's a poet, an amazing figure in the DC literary and arts and cultural community, uh, and a previous craft chat participant here at the Writer Center. So I'm so excited to see them both here today and to hand off to them now. Uh, and I'll let them maybe say, if they'd like to just say who they are to the audience beyond my little really, really brief introduction there and, and hand off to them. So Tracy and Terry, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited now to become an audience member and uh, take it away. Terry, okay. you want me to go or you want to go? Um, here, you go. Well, thanks for having us, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We're just so happy to see so many faces tonight. I am Tracy Cross. I am a horror writer that may have gotten skipped over, but uh, yeah, I, I'm a fiction horror writer. And I have been published in several anthologies. I've done some work with Rabia Chaudhry. Um, I've also been published in Other Terrors, which is a new anthology that came out in July. Um, and my pronouns are she, her, and mom. This is my uh, first big book to come out. So I'm super excited, but I'm also pretty nervous a little bit. So thank you. All right. So hi, I'm Terry Ellen Cross Davis. Uh, I'm the second eldest. Tracy's the eldest. Um, we have a younger sister, Tony, who's a children's librarian. You say that. I know, well, you know, like it, three years, nine months. It's like, you see, know, whatever. Go with this. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, let's see. So I'm 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 a poet. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I like that, Tracy. Mom. She her mom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> totally, totally mom. Um <clears throat> and I'm just really excited to to be here tonight to talk to Tracy about her book and to talk about. Um, how our Barbie adventures led to this. I mean, there were so many Barbie adventures. And, and to talk about um, just the writer's craft and how she crafted this incredible story. So what else do you need to know? Um, so I am the Obi Hardison Poetry Series Curator for the Folger Shakespeare Library and the Folger Poetry Programs Manager. Um, a More Perfect Union is my second book. My first book is Haint, which actually Haint has a whole thing um, in Haint and Haint Blue has a whole thing in root work. So you can really tell that we're sisters um, and that we've been inspired by many of the same kind of folklorish stories that we grew up with. Um, so I think that's, that's a, yeah, that, that's enough. So let's just jump right in. So um, that's it. If we yeah. go with your awards, Terry, we'll be here all night. So. Oh, oh, stop it, stop <laughs> it. Um, so we, we wanted to do this and we wanted to create a moment where we wove fiction and poetry together. So Tracy, we're gonna have you start off. Okay, so, oh, I wanted to let you guys know, Root Work is a novel that takes place in 1889 in Paris in Louisiana. It's about three sisters that go and spend the summer with their hoodoo practicing Aunt Theodora. So it's about love, family life, and, you know, there's a little bit of darkness in the human heart. So I hope you guys get it. And the parts that I'm going to read today will basically show the relationship between the three sisters, because I figured that was the most important, especially considering I have two younger sisters. So <laughs> it would be nice to share that. So I will start and then Terry's gonna read a poem and then I'll, I guess I'll go back. Betty laughed, picked up the cleaver again and stepped out the door. You coming, gotta get them chores done and that laundry ain't gonna fold itself. Pee Wee picked up the basket and walked like she was a rich woman holding her nose high in the air. Thanks kind lady for holding that door open. I appreciate it. You sure is stupid, but you make me laugh with your stupid self. Betty and Pee Wee broke up laughing. Pee Wee asked, if and you help me with the Fulton, can I walk with you to get the chicken? Sure, why not? Y'all eat all them candies, Anne yelled from the step. She stood in the doorway, tying her apron around her waist. I mean, they's the only real sweets we don't get once in a while. Pee Wee put her hands on her hips. We left yours on the bed, now go. She always making like she the oldest of us, Betty mumbled, making plans and everything. She ain't the boss of me. 
all 14 and you so tough, Pee Wee elbowed Betty. Better than to be 10 and scrambling behind everybody and sniffing their butts, Betty nudged her back. Betty ran and grabbed one end of the sheet off the clothesline and Pee Wee held the other. The way they folded the sheet was like a dance, in, then out, down, and up. So that, I loved how Tracy described cleaning and folding in that moment. And what it brought to my mind was a poem that I wrote called The Goddess of Cleaning. So in A More Perfect Union, I created my own goddesses, and this is one of them. And I like to think that these goddesses of cleaning and the idea of the goddess of cleaning was, was heavily influenced by our, our maternal grandmother and our um, maternal great aunt, uh, Lola and Katie May, both who worked as domestics in Cleveland. So the goddess of cleaning. I bequeath you bleach, it's singeing sting. I bequeath you the scrub brush, best done on hands and knees. I bequeath you ammonia for the exorcism of dirt. I bequeath you power over clutter, the washing machine spin, the dryer's lint grin. I bequeath you the salvation of sweeping, a consecrated grip on the broomstick. I bequeath you the dustpan's collection plate, the floor's sanctified echo, the trash bin's penitent face. I bequeath you the gospel of a mop, the sacred slosh of a rinse bucket second coming. I bequeath you the torn t-shirt as rag, the two-sided sponge, vinegar and newspaper squeak, the glass free of streak. I bequeath you an old toothbrush for tiles hard to reach grime. I bequeath you the grunt and scrub of wool, the eradication of rust. Trust in me, I baptize you in sweat, labor's batific stain. I bequeath you the power to change one room at a time. Couldn't you just listen to her like all night? Like you could just totally like, you never, you never read to me like that when I was, you know, at home. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay, so we start with day two because the sisters have gone on their voyage and they're meeting their aunt and now they're at her house. They're gonna spend three days at her house. This is day two. On the second day after a breakfast of beans and rice, Teddy gathered the girls to the front porch and gave each of them a bucket. Fill them up. With what, Betty asked. Pee, pee in them buckets all day. Teddy smiled at the looks on the girls' faces. Oh, you ain't never worked in them brothels, huh? They ask you to do even more strange stuff. We're not gonna go too far from the house today. I just need all your pee in them buckets, please. Teddy sat on the couch, one long leg draped over the other in denim jeans. Betty glared at Anne. I swear on all is holy, I'ma beat your ass when this is done. I wanna see you try. Anne set her bucket on the floor. Cause you ain't never done it before and you ain't never gonna do it now. Pee Wee felt the hostility growing between them like two firecrackers with their fuses tied together. Um, Anne, let's go out and slop the pigs or something. Anne snatched her arm from Pee Wee's grip. Ain't no damn pigs to slop. Let's just uh, go outside then. Pee Wee stood between them. Please, this ain't over you. Anne raised two fingers and pointed at her eyes and then Betty. That mean you can see or something? You as dumb as the day is long. Betty picked up her bucket and walked in the opposite direction and into the house. Let me go for, I'm going for a walk. Anne stomped the, across the porch and climbed down a ladder and her bucket, with her bucket mumbling to herself. Pee Wee went to follow her, slinging her leg over the ladder. You uh, always jump in between them two? Teddy asked from the couch. Pee Wee stopped. None of this started till we came here. Nowadays, like cats and dogs all the time. The Goddess of the South. I'm Mama telling you the best way to rid them pimples was to wash your face with fresh morning urine. I'm there when your mama teaches you how to pick chitlins, small fingers finding bits of straw and bone until a full bucket cooks down to one plate. I was in your mother's hand as she rounded your head as a baby, them soft spots shifting into the curve of her palm. I'm sugar, bacon, soda, cornmeal, and the cast iron skillet when your great aunt shows you how to make cornbread from scratch. I'm every bite of peach cobbler you sneak even though you allergic to peaches. Remember how you ain't no Bessemer was Bessemer until a road trip to Atlanta bought you in shouting distance of Alabama? 
or Auntie Sara Lee's real name was Sarah Lee, how I dragged your northern tongue, taught it to linger in the soft vowels, the syrup of me thick like alaga in your mouth. I'm in every shotgun story you know, like that time you and your sister heard that rattle when y'all was playing in the tall grass near Auntie Surly's juke joint. Mm-hmm. How matter of fact and fluid that big woman was, putting a plate of freshly fried chicken in front of y'all with one hand, grabbing her shotgun with the other and kept it stepping. But I evolved too, baby. My young preachers keep me so fresh and so clean. I glean in the grits you pour butter and yes, sugar, because I do as you do, my beautiful brown children. When you spread to California, Wisconsin, New York, Illinois, and Ohio, you take me with you. You make neck bones. Teach your children how to work hard for such sweet little meat. You cut rabbit chunks into your oxtail soup. You house the children of this cousin, that daughter, this sister, and raise them as your own. Arms always extended in a net of family of blood. How I groomed you, child. Let you over here. She ain't got a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. And what you get in the giddy up is what you get in the round up. I'm always at your table. The hot sauce you want on Friday's fried fish. That hankering for smothered pork chops you get on dreary November days. I lecture you in your sleep. When a shuddering of past relatives show up, you wake knowing it's been a visitation. If you tell your mama, she gonna reach for the numbers book. I keep one of your feet planted firmly in my red clay, be it Little Rock, Pine Bluff, or Crisp County, Georgia. With honeyed names like Nay, Cousin Peaches, Grease, Junebug, I keep your mind running in circles, connecting blood to family, friends, and back. Baby girl, you'll never be free of me. All the black bodies I've consumed, Y'all's blood makes the soil shine. The roots of your family tree may shift so some of the dirt falls across the Mason-Dixon line, but I will always claim you as mine, mine, mine. If you ever change your mind about leaving, leaving me behind. Lola visits the underworld. Lola did what Orpheus couldn't. She snatched her big sister straight from hell. Folks say the war changed Sis's men, but he wasn't no dummy before. He came from this mess, putting hands on women. The first time he hit Sis, Lola was little, maybe seven, maybe six. She balled up her tiny fist and punched him in the back, called her brother's sisters sorry bastards for not backing her up. There was another time he hit and another, until the day came he put Sis in the hospital. A metal plate in her head, stitches where the knife cut. For seven days, she was a shade of herself. When she finally walked out, Lola was right there next to Sis's man. Baby Sis Betty came for backup. Four of them in the car. Ride ain't never been quieter. Sis's man dropped them home on his way to work. His heel barely left the door sill when the sisters pulled suitcases out. The bus ride north was long. Once, twice, Sis said she thought about going back, but Lola told her, Sis, don't look back. Don't ever look back. She never did. That fool Orpheus could learn something. Pee Wee lay in bed listening to the crickets outside the window. Someone played a fiddle in a distance. Low tones from conversations drifted in through the window like secrets escaping people's lips. Outside the window, the round white moon cast beams down onto the leaves across the way. Shadows moved through the burned remnants of the former voodoo house like ghosts. She tossed and turned until she kicked the sheets off and went downstairs in her white dress pajamas. Ma sat in the chair in the corner of the room with a huge bowl stirring. What you making? Pee Wee asked, pulling up the stool at her feet. Cornbread for tomorrow. Do me a favor, get that skillet off the shelf and grease it for me. Pee Wee grabbed the heavy iron skillet off the shelf, walked over to the stove and grabbed a jar of lard. She pulled the dish rag off the front of the stove, dipped it into the lard and rubbed it over the inside of the skillet. You know what's gonna happen tomorrow? Pee Wee asked as she wiped. Ma laughed to herself. Everything gonna be right with the world. That's what's gonna happen. I don't understand. She finished and wrapped the rag around the handle on the skillet. It's ready. Ma lumbered over and poured the cornbread batter into the skillet. She smiled to herself. Betty is gonna leave, you know. Okay and we leaving too. What? Pee Wee's hand shook. Why? It's time, baby. After all this, I got in touch with my kin and we got some land in Arkansas. Ma grunted and put the skillet in the oven. 
this place hold nothing but bad for me now. And Betty leaving, well, I got to worry about you and Ann, but I can't stay here no longer. It's like your pie is here and he all around me, but I can't touch him. That's why we should stay, Pee Wee yelled. I don't want to go. I don't know what to tell you. School's starting about a month or so, and we got to get you situated and stuff. Ma groaned as she walked back over to the chair. Pee Wee snatched the empty cornbread bowl off the stove and dumped water into it. She picked it up and walked out the back door to wash it. She vibrated with rage. She didn't want to leave. She looked up from washing the bowl and saw Betty walking towards her, holding Jean's hand, laughing. Pee Wee, you look lower than a bow legged toad. Betty sat next to her on a step. What's going on? Pee Wee opened her mouth to speak, but a sob poured out before she could stop it. Betty looked at Jean and motioned for him to leave. Pee Wee's hand shook. She almost dropped the bowl. Her body shivered as tears ran down her cheeks. Come on, give me that. Betty took the bowl from Pee Wee. You don't understand. Nobody understand me, Pee Wee stood. Her white dress pajamas swung in a light breeze. Nobody listen. What about what I want? Betty set the bowl on the step and stood. Pee Wee? You leaving, my leaving, and leaving, and me, I'm leaving. I don't want to go. Can I go to finish at school or something with you? I think Ma already paid for it. She's been paying for a while. Betty reached out to touch Pee Wee. But I'm sure we can talk to, ain't nothing to talk about, she yelled. Everybody that made plans for Pee Wee, pushing and pulling at me. And I never ever get to say nothing. Like everybody know what's best for me, but me. But you're just a kid, Betty snapped. You need to look, someone to look after you. Not like you care, you ain't even gonna be here. Ma stood in the doorway. Pee Wee, Hattie, you don't disrespect your sister like that. All oh, y'all pushing, y'all pulling. What if I did a spell and made all y'all disappear, huh? I've been practicing some. I know what I'm doing. I make this whole place gone. Then what? Nobody yell at me no more. Pee Wee rammed her fist to her eyes, trying to stop the tears. You don't, Ann started. What? I don't what, Ann, Pee Wee yelled. We just trying to look out for you. Betty started, but Ma raised her hand to silence her. Pee Wee glared at all of them, then whirled and ran barefoot across the village. She ran until her legs turned her toward the bridge that connected their cabins to the horse stables. She ran across the bridge, releasing a scream that had pent up inside her since her pa died. She ran and screamed until her legs shook and her voice was gone. The goddess of anger. Did he touch you? Did he hit you? With jagged words or closed fists? Did he laugh at you? Were you polite even then? Were you lava under the skin? Then let me in, unsheath the dagger of me. You tasted pain, now let me master it. Let me in, I'll use the dust of his bones for tea. I'll rise vengeful and caustic, a florid fury steeped in seething. I'll make his eyes bleed. Let me in, I'll dissect him unflinchingly. A backhand slap, a rake of fingernails, I'll spit my small mercies. I'll dance on him in stilettos, paint my toenails opi red while the blood congeals. Let me be your ignition point, your pitch, the whoosh of hot sweet breath. I'm all your swallowed heat simmered into flesh. I too can lift burdens. Let go of fear, of retribution. Let go of decorum and shame. Ride rage until it bucks and jump on it again. Damn it, let me, let me. Let me in. The account of Katie May from my grandmother, September 9th, 1926, July 26th, 2019. This poem is woven between the preamble to the Constitution. We, the people, three fifths of a person, in order to form a more perfect union, when Ann started school, they closed it rather than have black kids go. It was closed for two years established justice. I was working at this cafeteria. It was all white. The manager came in the back and said, don't send any food out. We didn't know what it was about. They wouldn't let us serve food. It was a sit-in. After he closed that cafeteria, closed it period, I thought, why do people hate us so bad? So bad you won't give us a little food or don't want us to sit down or even close your cafeteria on account of we want to eat. Ensure domestic tranquility. We made our dolls from the flour sack, burlap, 
picture of a pretty blonde girl, we stuffed her with cotton. Provide for the common defense. The way my father told me we had land in Georgia till the Klan ran us off it. Promote the general welfare. My brother died when he was 10 years old. He was real smart, but he got sick. He had to go miles and miles to get to a hospital. Thinking after I was growing up, if he had gone to a hospital, he would have lived. And secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. I worked on the farm, picked cotton as soon as I could get out there, as late as I could stay. Sunrise to sundown, and you want to be out early before it gets so hot, because the sun beaming down on you all day is more than a notion. The farm we worked on was a half and half. Whatever you have, half of it goes to the man that owned the farm. The next to you, that was your payment do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. So we got through that part. <laughs> um, so I just wanna say that if you have questions, people, please place them in the chat and we will do our best to get to them. But um, I, I really want to, I, I love it that there's so much overlap between what Tracy writes and what I write. So you hear a lot of names back and forth. But what I really wanna start with is Tracy, I wanna ask you about the inspiration for root work and where did it come from? Well, our grandmother, Katie May, um, was not, when she was alive, she really wouldn't talk much about like when she um, was growing up. So one day I kind of caught her and I read a story to her, a horror story that I wrote about her little brother that died. And she just kind of smiled and she goes, yeah, okay, that, that sound about right. And then she gave me a couple of little corrections to make. And then she just started opening up and telling me things. And I can't really say all the things that she said because the main thing that she said inspired root work, but it was as she was telling me, I was like, you know, this is really significant. I need to get this done. And because she was legally blind, she couldn't see me slowly reaching for my iPhone and grabbing it and kind of record it, slide the phone up closer to her but everyone else in the house could see me doing it. You know, Terry, you saw, and it was just like, I wanna get a copy of that. And so, um, yeah, it was just very alarming because even my mom came over to me later and she said, you know, your grandmother doesn't talk much about like her past or even when she was growing up and her namesake who was her grandmother. And I was just shocked that I was able to get this story, these stories from her. and. I, right when she told me the the most the most interesting part, let's call it, I knew that I had like to write this story. I knew that I had to do it. And so I want to add in too that um, to, like the last three years of our grandmother's life, I began to do more recordings of her and video recordings. I even had uh, my daughter uh, interview her, which is how I found out the story about the dolls, because, you know, you have a kid now and, you know, they're used to dolls and, and black Barbie dolls, which I remember when mommy got us Golden Dream Barbie, which to be creative, we really just named that Barbie GD, like for Golden Dream. Like that was like the most creative thing we had. <laughs> I think about that we a lot. We had so um, many Barbies, we couldn't like name them all. So like, I think they started taking on the names of the countries that they were they from. They like did. India Tracy Barbie. was India. I mean, like Scottisha. That was the Scottish Barbie, Tracy. I just want you. I know. I know. <laughs> oh my God, Scottisha. Oh that, no. That's, that's all we had, and I'm just like, why couldn't we come up with something better than Scottisha <laughs> for the Scottish Barbie? But whatever. I digress. So the movie was. So that's when I told the story. Oh my God. I know. I know. I had to pull that one out from the archives. Um, but that's when Zoe got the story from Ma about Ma not having a doll. You know, and like it was just mind blowing to me about like not having a doll. It's something that's so simple to me now. But when Ma said, no, we, we, we took the doll from the burlap sack that we had and we stuffed cotton in there and then we sewed it together. And I was like, that's hard. The flower, the flower sacks. 
Exactly. I yeah, was like she that. Was telling me they they designed them in different. Um, I know after she said it, I did some research. So when the government found out that people were using the flower sacks to sew dresses to wear. Mm -hmm they decided mm. to design the flower sacks a little differently so that they would look a little bit more flamboyant and not look like a flower sack, which was kind yeah. of like there was like a white one with little blue flowers. Every time they bought flower out, it was a different type of flower sack. Oh, interesting. I did not I'm know a writer. That. What to do. <laughs> this is, this is, so one of, one of the questions in there was something, I know, I know we do have to write something about Scott Tasha, um, was a question about, uh, a like your influences what writers influence your work and like you know uh so don asked this question and i definitely wanted to get to this because tracy and i um the one place that we could go kind of more freely to was the lee harvard library yes you remember tracy and we take our bikes down there and ride down there and spend like the whole day down there because our parents knew that's where we were you know and it was a good safe spot and whatever it's just right down the street um, not like just, it was a nice yeah, But you ride. know what, when you look at it now, you were like, what the hell were we thinking? That was a I long know. ride and it was all downhill. And then going back, it was all uphill. No wonder we had like thighs that could crush melons when we were little, because yeah. this was, that was just, woo. But yeah. they loved us down there. And I was so, always so happy to go because it was like, once we like tore through that library then we would go to the downtown library which we would catch the 15 bus yeah and my mom was just like you know y'all got to stay together and, and and hold each other's hands and stay with each other and you know she was more worried about us being on the bus than us even being at the library and we were so excited to go to the library that we didn't even care what happened on the bus we were just like oh yeah we're going to the library we were so excited but I will say some of my influences for writing, um, I want to drop this little nugget that I talked to Terry about earlier. The funny thing is I'm the horror writer, she's the poet, but when we were younger, Terry was the one that was into horror. She was really like hardcore horror. She read F. Paul Wilson's The Keep. She um, watched Videodrome and then she would come and give me like these like nine-year-old interpretations of it. And she's like, the heads are going through the TV, Tracy. And I would just be like, oh my God, like I cannot, I cannot. Like I was more night gallery when I was nine because I think that was the big thing. And then there was a show called In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy that I would watch. And that has some really scary stuff on it. It was so scary that I was like, you know what? I can't even watch this. Like I would just like leave the room. Like I can't, I can't. I would freak out like they had um what if aliens came and came to Earth. And I'll never forget because I was eight. They had this silver spaceship land and it was this alien with a round head and nothing but really big lips. And it just was talking. And I'm just sitting there looking at my parents like, oh somebody is not going to sleep well tonight. So I don't quite know when it switched for us, but then like I slowly moved towards um, horror because I started watching the Twilight Zone. My dad was like, well, you like Night Gallery, you should watch Twilight Zone and then you should watch Outer Limits. And I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, but Outer Limits scared me because I thought that they really took over the TV. Like it was like, do not adjust your set. And I'm just like, oh my God, they're here. You know, I was like freaking out so bad. So I was like, I can't watch this dad. There's people taking over the TV. And he's just like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, but um, I did start watching Twilight Zone and I like, I started to take in mind the writers of the episodes that I liked, which were Richard Matheson and Charles Beaumont. And then I noticed that in those specific episodes, it would star, of all people, William Shatner. So I'm like, oh man. So then I found out they, they were like a little click in the 50s. And I was like, well, I gotta go find this like chart, this Matheson dude and see what he wrote. And I went down to Cleveland Public Library and I, my cousin worked there and he had a first edition copy of I Am Legend. And he, I said, I need to read this. And he goes, you can't take it out. Like you gotta read it back here. So I had to sit in the back in the staff room and read it at the library. And I was like, after that, it just went all, you know, it was Beaumont and then it went to um, 
a touch of Stephen King, but more Poppy Z. Bright, Douglas Winter, who wrote Primeval. And I just, I, it's so awesome because I got to meet like most of my heroes, which was just like Doug, Douglas Winter. I met F. Paul Wilson. And I'm just, and he even blurred my book. So I'm just like super excited about it. But yeah, I love horror so much now. But Terry, does not. <laughs> No, I still do. I still do. I love a good, I love the supernatural stuff too, which is why, I mean, like we grew up on comic books and we grew up on the uncanny X-Men, Chris Claremont, 1987. Um, and, you know, and yeah, and we read a lot of Stephen King and Anne Rice. Oh my gosh, you know, and maybe that was later, but then we were reading so much stuff because young adult literature wasn't what it is now. So I went from reading like children's books to V.C. Andrews, which is a whole other thing. Um, and, you, you know, know what? The other thing was that we didn't see ourselves represented in no, any of the not. books that we read. No. So people no. like try to say like, um, well, why, why do you write? Why do you do this? And I'm like, because I want like little black girls or little girls of color to pick up a book of mine and go, you know what? this girl sees me she sees me and I'm here and I feel represented because you when we were growing up every black person in every book movie tv show whatever that was scary was the first one to die the you red know? shirt yeah and then like you know when the black person made it to the end we were like yeah we would cheer and everything and then of course right at the end the, the demon would come out like ah! And like stab them. You're just like, oh, so much for that. But now in my work, the black girl lives and she tells the tale and she handles everything. And she she's really, you know, that person that every black girl would probably want to be like, I'm strong like her. This girl has got me down. Terry, so I have a question for you though. Oh, okay. Um, what compelled you to share so much information? in your books about our family and do you have people walk up to you and like act like they know you or talk about the similarities between our family and theirs i i don't um have people do that and and i think maybe that's just because of the timing with the pandemic the book came out last february so a lot of the readings that i've done um have been like virtual and i have some done a few things in person um but I felt like, um, you know, someone had asked me, like, what, what are some of the poets who inspire me? So this answers both questions. Lucille Clifton. Lucille Clifton is my favorite all-time poet, right? I can read Lucille all day, every day. And, you know, Lesson of Falling Leaves, let's go. You know, Mercy, let's go. Good woman, let's go. Um, and so what Lucille Clifton did for me when I would read her work was she elevated a world that I knew. And I thought, you know, for me, what makes a poem, you elevate something in a poem and, and you, you preserve it. Um, you're trying to capture what, what can't be captured with language, right? And so that's, that's what made me want to come to these stories of our family um, because I felt like our family stories were so rich. And I loved that, you know, um, Lucille Clifton had a poem about Study the Masters, one of my favorite poems of hers, where she talks about her Aunt Timmy and how she's ironing the master poet's teats. And I thought, yeah, Aunt Timmy deserved that poem, just like Lois, uh, you know, Lola deserves a poem, just like Katie May deserves a poem, just like Anne needs this mention in this poem. So I wanted to elevate just, a, you know, our family and, and the richness of those stories. And I wanted to capture them. And I wanted to share what made them full and whole and so nurturing for us because we have so many great stories. And even just between, you know, the two of us, the trips down to Arkansas and doing this and doing that, um, and Auntie Surly's juke joint and, and those rattlesnakes. Um and at the time <laughs> you saw the snake, you know, <laughs> and uh Terry was, how old were you when we went to Arkansas? Because if I was like eight, you were like what, three or four? Yeah, yeah, that and would have to be right. <laughs> we were standing on the porch. She had this big old southern porch, and there was nothing to do. Like, we had, I think there was one channel, and it was like Bozo the Clown would come on at three o'clock. So we would just kind of hang out in the neighborhood. And we had a cousin, and her name was Dodo. I will never forget her. And um, 
she would come over because they're like, your cousin Dodo is here. And for some reason, Terry and Dodo did not get along at all. All right, all right, all right. you can stop this story. You can stop this story. I was just like, <laughs> what? But we were all out on the porch one day and Terry's so tiny. She's always been so little. And she looks over the edge and she goes, snake, snake. And it's like a black snake. I would say maybe 18 inches. It wasn't a very big snake. So between Auntie Shirley's house and the cafe were three houses that she rented to like the neighborhood, these three guys. So Terry's yelling snake, Auntie Shirley comes running from the restaurant, grabs the shotgun, hikes her skirt up, puts her foot up on the rail and goes, where is it, baby? And then here come all these men running from the houses with shotguns. And they're like, little one, tell us where the snake is. And Terry's like, it's right there, it's right there. They shot that ground up so much. All that was left was smoke. And I'm looking at Terry like, you just had to do it. And they're like, is it gone? Is it gone, baby? And Terry's like, I don't see it. I don't see it no more. And I'm just standing there like, y'all just shot the hell out of that snake. Like there's nothing left. It was just dirt floating in the air. And I'm sitting, I'm thinking like, so what do we do now? You know, and they're like, good job, little one. Good job. And I'm looking at Terry like, don't you ever do this again. Don't you ever, if you see a snake, let it go. But don't you ever do this again. Yeah, mm. we have like a million stories about Arkansas that when we were little, like when we, we went down and we said, what is that thing out back? And they said it was an outhouse. And we were like, what the hell is an outhouse? And they were like, do you want to go in? And I'm like, oh, no, because that's over a trench. I don't know what that is. I don't want to do that. So it was almost like they were still using outhouses. It was 78, I think. Yeah. And that's showing our age right there. But we're Gen X, Gen X. Yeah. But, uh, so, oh, wait, we have a couple other questions, too, because someone asked about your research. And I was, I was, um really keen to get to that. Um, like what kind of research did you do, Tracy, about the historical period that you wrote in and how did you balance the fiction narrative with the historical narrative? That was Amy's question. So to, during the pandemic, um, a lot of writers that I knew were having a hard time writing. They were just having a hard time coming up with things or because we were all indoors, people just could not, network, you know, Zoom was new. Nobody really knew how to use Zoom. So I I came up with the Accountability Club. So, and I don't even think you know this, Terry. So the Accountability Club was where you would get with another person and you would say like, what do you need to do? Or what do you need that would help you to write or produce writing or literature or whatever? And I worked with a girl and she said, you know, I need beta readers for my work. I said, I know like six people so I can hook you up with them. And she goes, well, what do you need? So she has a, liter a degree in literature, folktale and folklore. So I said, well, hey, I need to have something that shows me linguistics in the late 1800s in the South. And maybe if you can find some books on hoodoo, not voodoo, that would be great. So she's like, okay. So we had the deal with the accountability club is we had to meet every two weeks. So within two weeks, I started getting these big, huge emails. And I'm like, what is this? And she goes, I got you. So what she found was a book that was five volumes, it was 5,000 pages. And it was a white man that went down south between the late 1800s and the early 1910s. And then he would record conversations that he had with people on this like, like record player kind of thing. And they had some sound bites from it too. I heard different sound bites, but then she also bought over some Zora Neale Hurston for me to read, which I was so upset that like, I really started digging her after that. I'm like, I wish I could have started, you know, earlier with Zora because she's just amazing. But she had, um, I can't remember the name of the book, but it was just folk tales. So Zora would transcribe the folk tales as the people spoke. So mm -hmm. I, it was hard because I was trying to read this and I'm like, it, it was just a lot of apostrophes and a lot of endings dropped off words. 
And you just see, like, you're sitting there and you're reading it out loud. My kid comes in, she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, just go away, baby. Mommy's trying to get this story. So, but once you learn it and you understand the cadence of it, you kind of get into the groove of it. So I took that one small part of the story that my grandma gave me and I don't write outlines. Uh, That was a question. I just kind of write the idea and build the world around the idea. So I know that I have like an exposition, rising action, the climax, then the um, ending, like the, and then, you know, just the line off. It's like a diagonal line that I use. So I just started to, um, that was, I, I haven't gone through all, I think I have 2000 pages left to go through, but I did go through 3000 pages, which I am very proud that I did. And I did read all the Zora Neale Hurston. And I mean, these were first edition books and she didn't have to bring those books over, but she did. And I shared the, my idea with other people. I ended up even getting a little grant for it. You know, I won like the Ladies of Horror Fiction grant for the Accountability Club because I helped so many people during the pandemic with their writing. It was just like a really great feeling. So yeah, that's the research that I did. I listened to a little bit of things. And then the other thing is that um, Pinterest is awesome. So (laughs) what you do is you go in and you make like a Pinterest board. Okay, I would make like a Pinterest board and I would go, I need pictures of swamps and houses in Louisiana. And they would put these houses up. So the secret is to describe the houses in in the writing. But the bigger secret is when you write to incorporate all five senses, which gives the feeling of more of an immersive feel. A lot of people will say root work feels like it's a full immersion. Like I can hear everything around me. Like I feel like I'm sitting in the room and it's almost like I have to ask permission to say something. You know, a lot of people pick it up and they're like, we don't want to put it down, but that's the secret is a a good Pinterest page and just a really, really active imagination because you have to like describe everything. You have to, I see things like a movie and then I write down everything that I see, which there's a specific name of people that write like that. So yeah. The the funny thing about engaging all five senses is something that I'm always talking about with poetry Um, and I always do this to remind myself of all those, you know, you know, touch, sight, smell, all these things. But those those five senses to me have to be engaged in a good poem to place the reader where you want them to be and to bring them alive in that way. So I think that's kind of kind of funny that it overlaps that way for you. Um, all those five senses work for you for fiction, but all those five senses work for me for poetry too. Um, there was we don't even we oh. didn't even know this about each other. That that's so I know. That's, 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 that's like pretty deep, yeah, you know. Yeah. And um, I want to make sure I don't forget to say this. People, if you are out there and you have access to your elders, please record them. Please get them that's, on oh, get get them on audio now because there's a whole generation and there's so much that we have as a rich culture and tradition, and I don't want to lose it. And I think we're finally getting to a point where we can recognize like Zora Neale Hurston did that this is something that you have to, you, you have to become the, the cultural anthropologist. You have to save these stories um, because they're, they, what, they're what make America, America. They're what make black people, black people. They make all of this, all of this combined. And, um, and we will lose all of that. We'll lose that as history. They, we'll lose, yeah. I was talking to my great aunt Lois once and she got real relaxed and mm. she said, yeah, Tracy, we were living some Goldstone times. And I'm like on the phone going, what? And she goes, yeah, Goldstone times, you know? And I'm like, I uh, no, I don't know what Goldstone times are. And she was just like, you don't know? Like, like, you know, like I was I'm like, I am not even like, you know, 40. What are you talking about? And it turns out Goldstone times are like, the good times when everything was great, hence Goldstone times. I didn't know this. So you have a whole set of linguistics that will be lost if we don't record them. And even though, even if you see someone and they're not your ancestors or they're not like related to you, talk to them. Get these words, still record something because once they are gone, the words turn to dust 
and nobody will remember them anymore. So it's important that we record this history in some kind of way and don't end up like, you know, these National Geographic people running up to the Appalachian Mountains trying to record a song that only like one 89 year old woman knows, you know, from like 1904. You know, we have to do this now, appreciate and do it now because when you're dead, that's it. That's it. You know, unless unless you believe in the hereafter, then you know what I'm here after. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> but there is another um, someone said there is another Emily asked the question. She said, how did your story change as you wrote it, if at all, from the original idea you had at the moment you first heard the most interesting part? And Ma, Ma, I will tell you, our A, we called our grandmother Ma because that's what our mother calls. Her mother <laughs> called her mother. So Ma. Everybody is, called her Ma. I know everybody called yeah, everybody her called her mom except for her sisters who called her sis right yes. which I thought was so cool okay, yes sis. Okay. Oh. exactly exactly oh, sis. Sis. <laughs> um and so yeah so I'm gonna say there so uh, yeah so that uh, Emily's question was that like how did you got the most interesting story but how did your story change when you knew that you wanted to kind of hold on to some nuggets and, and I take it, spilled them out a little later in the Conjure series. You wanna hear something funny about root work? This is, this is the best. So I started writing it, I shared it with my critique group, which was just two guys because we just lost like all the women in the group. And it was just the three of us for like years. Um, I started, we would go back and forth, back and forth. Then I would call my mom and we would go back and forth like, mom. And she's like, Tracy, I think you should take that out. I was like, oh, excuse me. You know, like not you <laughs> writing now. Hello. So I wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I stopped because I just felt like I hit a wall. And I'm like, I got to the incident, but it became... If you ever watch old time movies and, and the bad guys, you know they're bad guys because they're doing things like <laughs> like they're twirling their mustaches and stuff. The bad guys in the book became caricatures. You know, they might as well have walked in with like, yeah, kids. <laughs> so I, I just knew I had to put it down and walk away from it. Well, I walked away from it for a while. And then I forgot that I sent out like 10 pages to an agent and this agent emails me. She's like, oh my God, I love this. You know, and she emailed me in a very short period of time and she goes, send me the entire manuscript. And I'm like, but, but it's not done. I, I, I don't know if I told you that Terry, because I was just like, it's not done. And I sat down and banged out the rest of this story in like 48 hours. So mm. it started out like, you know, two years of research to like one manuscript request. And then it was just, bing, 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 bing. you know, I just was like stressed. And she's like, oh my God, I love it. I love it. I love it. I can't remember what happened with me and the agent, but she just was like, oh, it got picked up by someone. And she was like, next story that you have next book, please get in touch with me because I would love to rep you for that book. Now, and I would tell you the funny thing about that too is that in many ways, that's kind of how it works for me with poetry. So someone had asked if we were both English majors and indeed, yes, like my background is I have a bachelor's degree in journalism and magazine journalism from Ohio University and then the MFA um, in creative writing. Uh, with emphasis in poetry from American University with some and some graduate work in international affairs and African studies, which led me to a stint in Kenya and learning some Kiswahili for a while. Um, but I, I wanted to be an English major. I didn't want to be a journalism major. I was afraid to be an English major because I didn't think that poets could make money and I didn't have a job. And, you know, there's always that hard line of got to have a job, got to have something that, you know, would provide. Um, can I jump in here? Because what the funny thing is, is I was an English major with the focus <laughs> on fiction, creative writing, and psychology. So I think it's just kind of odd that you wanted to do it and didn't do it, and I did it. I just, you mm -hmm. know, and now I'm sitting here going, what am I going to do? I'm going to teach children. I'd love to mm -hmm. do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it just, it it's, so to answer that question, like that is, that is our, our, our background. So, but the thing about it is, is we grew up in a house full of books and I cannot stress that enough. Like we had so many books and part of like, part of the reason we had access even to the Stephen King stuff was um, our Aunt Debbie had all those Stephen King books, remember? And we could go over there and then after a while she stopped letting Debbie us Debbie had Anne Rice, mommy had Stephen King. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, so, but we had access to books, people. 
And that's, that's the thing. And like the library was the free spot that we could go. And so it, it's, it, it created a world in which we knew that there were bigger worlds out there, which is why our Barbies, I truly tell you, I'm not kidding you. My Barbie was a journalist who traveled the world, right? My Barbie was a writer and we had all kinds of Barbie adventures, Corvettes, Barbie mansion. It was great. And, and so this was set also- up on, on the stairs at the exactly. house. And, yes. and make our dad mad because he's like, get these toys off the steps, you know? And it was like the most forbidden land was the stairs. So right. he would have like a Barbie camp out and then he walked down the stairs in the morning and stepping on Barbie's like, what the hell is this? Trans and I'm just like, doggone it, you know? Or we'd have Cookie Monster chained up or get or something. <laughs> Barbies would be chained up and Cookie Monster's coming, which I don't even understand, like, you look back at this stuff that we did and you really have to wonder, like, were we touched? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the funny thing is, like, I have a whole poem in A More Perfect Union about Barbie and the Cookie yes. Monster because we had, we had so many Cookie Monster ventures. So, um, uh, <laughs> and so I liked, um, oh, there's a question here. Got weirdy um, and asked, are you multi-creatives? Attracted to different mediums like books, novels, films, plays. Yes. How do you know which projects focus on? I, a, well, we absorb a lot. Tracy and I are always absorbing either new music, talking about, we'll talk about artists, we'll talk about movies, we'll talk about books. You should see our Libby account with our sister. Oh my gosh. Like, like and we have so many like back and forth. Did you read this book? And thank you for JM. Was that JM Mirror, Ordinary Monsters? That one was a good one. Um, and, you know, so like we're always trading books and ideas and we're always kind of in conversation about different things and pop culture too. Um, so much of that comes into uh, the conversation. And so, yeah, we, we'll, we'll sit here and, and dish on, on films all the time. And especially comic book films and all that stuff, like oh, like we're in a, we're in the golden age of Marvel right now. I've been saying that for a while. I'm I'm really excited. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's like yes, everything that we ever thought and dreamed of is coming to fruition, except for a really good Rogue movie, so we can get that love story between oh Rogue God. and Gambit. I know, be Gambit. still my heart. Whoa. I know, I know. Why is this not? And you know what? Shannon <laughs> Tatum would not have worked as Gambit. I'm gonna just no. let it out right now. Yeah, yeah. you and know. me both. We right here. We right here. No. no. And no. I think Anna Pack one was too short, quite honestly. I know. That's a whole, I, you know what? I might agree with you there. There's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> we are DC and Marvel. Remember that? Yes. We're DC and somebody says, you can't be one or the other. And I'm like, I'm both. I am all the things. I am exactly. all of the comics and you know. movies and everything. Because I just, Terry can tell you, I have a knack for memorizing movies and lines where people call up Tracy this movie had this line in it what, what what movie was it and I'm just like give me a second and I could just like name it super fast so I am I am Terry's personal data bank of farming of memories which I think is yeah. pretty cool well as the phrase goes Tracy has a memory like a steel trap and so I will also like to give a shout out to our mom because our mom is always coming up with these phrases and like these phrases pop out and that she ain't got to pot the pits in or a window to throw it out of but no that whole round up giddy up line, that was my mom and I dishing on Kim on um one of them Kardashian sisters. And I was like, oh, um, Chloe, line. Chloe, the yeah. big one, Chloe. Yes. Yes. That was that yes. was a great line. I was like, mom, say that again. Where's my pen? Let me write this down. So my mother and knows. You called by now. me. You called me and said, and I'm like, hold line. on. I have to write this down because this is some new stuff. I think the last thing she said to me was, um, that girl got her whole foot in the lion's mouth and I'm like what you know and she's like you know she got her whole foot in the lion's mouth she better learn how to move slow because if you move quick that lion is gonna bite you and I mean I'm like oh what is happening like mom what is going on I'm, I'm not understanding how this equals a lion but okay oh I just kind of go with it I love it I love it. I love it because it's such a colorful way. And it's not just colorful. It tells a story. And that's the thing. It tells a story and a moral, all of it, you know, all of it in one. I really did say the other day, um, I, you know, I guess so-and-so is smelling himself, you know, <laughs> like, like, and it just like, you just, these things pop out at you. And it's really funny too, being in Cleveland and then having all these Southern 
sayings floating around and then even just coming down a little bit to the northernmost southern city of DC um it, it, it feels a little bit like a like a little bit more of a homecoming like some of these things are more familiar to me um I especially in a story about Scottasia Terry since you got I that know. I'm I, so know. Well, I, still, I can't believe that that's all we named that doll I like I'm like really we couldn't come up with something better to be Scottish creative. Barbie an Indian Barbie because she was from India and she was India Tracy we named her India yeah India that's what Barbie. we named it oh Oh, yeah, I'm like, and what? GD, but it was Golden Dreams, yeah. It was GD, yeah. Like, I just want to go back and I just want to talk to little Terry and Tracy and be like, you know what, kids? Invest but, some but time and some names here. Jim, remain Jim. Yes. From Cuban Holograms. Yes, she yes. did. She stayed the same. So there we go. Jim, Jim is her name. No one else has the same. Um, <laughs> yes, okay. Sherita, I almost lost my mind. I almost <laughs> lost my mind. I'm just like, oh, I'm my God. I show's over. I'm just like, show's over, Synergy. And she's just like, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I just feel so idiotic. There was a question about Stephen King. Um, yeah. I do not get down with Stephen King. I do not. I am not the biggest Stephen King fan. There's a story I wrote about Stephen King on my blog um, that another Black author talked about. Stephen King has a tendency to use the tropes of the magical Negro so often. And it's just, I'm like, this isn't me. Like I, I remember, uh, Terry, you read Eyes of the Dragon and you liked that and you liked this stuff with Peter Straub, but I never remember you talking about any plain Stephen King. And then I saw mom had the stand so I said, oh, this looks good. She's like, uh, yeah, read Carrie. So I read Carrie and then she's like, I'm like, okay, I wanna read like, you know, this, this, the stand. And she goes, Tracy, Tracy, just read something else. Here's Master of the Game by Sydney Sheldon. And I'm just like, okay, so I read that. And then finally she just was like, well, he knows how to build up a good story but he just doesn't quite know how to end it. So then, I started noticing certain things within his work. And I went and I told my mom, I said, you know, just I'm reading the books and he keeps dropping these N words and just, I don't know. I and know. she's like, yeah. it took you long enough to figure that out on your own, so. And it's it's so hard when we were younger because representation wasn't there. We weren't quite mirrored in ways that we can be now. And thanks to things that you're writing that not only are we mirrored in, but we feel at home in. So um, I'm, I'm aware Absolutely. of the time. Yeah. I know, I know it's like, it's, it's 8.02. So I'm aware of the time. Um, but this has been so much fun. I and mean, you all should really just be flies on the wall. Tracy and I get into conversations like this all the time. And not to mention how many times I call you up and like, hey, can you write a story about this thing? Yes. <laughs> I need a story yeah. where I am like all the superpower heroes together. Like, no, I can't. I don't see why not. Um, I don't see why not. Uh, but, but it's like, but thankfully, you never call me up like, hey, you need to write a poem about this. So I appreciate that. Uh, I understand the craft. I understand the craft. But you know, still going. You think. I love how everybody throws an idea to, at the horror writer and they're just like, oh, write about this spider that was crawling on the wall. And I'm just like, no, I want to write about a damn spider crawling on the wall. Let me have my own ideas and let me write my own things. And to answer another question earlier, I have ventured into the forays of cyberpunk. So I've done some cyberpunk stories and horror, but that's about generally it. I don't really go outside of that, but horror breaks down into so many categories like Gothic and folk. So I have hit lots of categories within the horror genre, but I haven't stepped outside because I just cannot, you know, I save that for Terry the romantic. I can't, mm -hmm. I, I'd stab somebody or something. It's just not gonna happen. Well, I still am waiting on, we have to figure out something to do together. I don't know what, I don't know how. Um, and I will say that, uh, <laughs> and I will say too that um, I am I am getting curious about stepping outside of poetry just a little bit, maybe into flash fiction or flash fiction and prose poetry together. I feel like they're, cause like I, Tracy's, when somebody asked what are the things we love about each other as writers, I love Tracy's dialogue. I told her when I started Root Work, I was like, this is like eavesdropping on our grandmother and her sisters talking 
and we're supposed to be in the kitchen. And you know, I'm thinking about Ma's house uh, off of Kinsman. Um, you know, and like we're supposed to be in the kitchen and, you know, imagine Ma, Lois, Betty, everybody in the other room and we're not supposed to be hearing what they're saying and yet we're in it, you know? And so this, I, I love your dialogue. I feel like your dialogue is so spot on. It's so natural and musical out the mouth and which is what you want a poem to do, right? And so I, I, that's, that's, that's the thing I love. I, and I love the stories too, because again, they're stories that I know and they're stories that I know, you know, the archetypes of the characters, if you will. I can so. see that with your poetry, I just love how you expose yourself. Like you <laughs> just give it all. This is all, take all of me. And it doesn't bother you. Like for me, I would be petrified to write about like giving birth to a child. I would just be like, oh my God, this was a fiasco and I was bleeding everywhere, da, 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 da. But you take something that's so commonplace and you turn it into something that's so eloquent and beautiful that I can't do that because I'm a horror writer. So I would focus on the blood, <laughs> but it's just the way that you expose yourself, you give of yourself to your work. And that's so admirable that Aww. I'm just, whenever I get a book, I don't read it because I'm like, Terry, this is gonna be good. I'm just have to sit down and wait till I'm in that moment. And then I read it and I'll try and call you up and you know, like Terry, I love the book, you know, but mm -hmm. that's about it. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, well, I know, so I'm, so we're gonna bring, all right, Zach, you can, you can come on back in here. Yes, I agree, Colette. Um, I do want to collaborate on a, an adaptation. Um, and I want to work with Tracy on it because I want I want Tracy's dialogue. I'm like, yes, I want that dialogue. We're yeah. work. We're working. We're yeah. working. Sorry. <laughs> Tracy, Terry, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, so I think Richard said in the chat that they he, he wished all uh, author talks were like this. And I sort of agree. This was just so nice and uh it was so nice that you're so familiar with each other and each other's work that it was such a wonderful wonderful conversation so thank you for sharing with us thank you for for sharing for bringing the family together in the public for the, all of us to see this a little bit and it was a really really great conversation i hope everyone enjoyed it uh and please if you haven't bought the books already please uh, we put the links in a few more times please buy copies of the books i saw some people already said they had and uh we'll have the recording of this on our website soon so come back and watch it and we hope to see you again soon thank you everybody Thank you for having Thank us. You. Thank and you for please, having us. Yes, support Black writers, support Black women, buy our books. Yes, yes buy the books, buy the books.